George Tabor, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Central New York Chapter of the New York Forest Owners Association. And tomorrow is our annual meeting at 1 in the afternoon, and everyone is welcome to come to that. We have a, a booth over in the International Building, and New York Forest Owners uh, consists of about 2,200 members throughout the state, organized into 10 different chapters, and this part of New York State is uh, Onondaga County is one of our Central New York chapters. And we sponsor these seminars every year at the Farm Show, um, as well as the booth and uh, the annual meeting. And so there's a lot of activity that goes on in NIFOA, so please, uh, and we do have a very uh, uh, active website, so NIFOA.org, and so there's, there's information about the organization available if anyone would like it. So with no further ado, I guess I'll get right into uh, our first seminar here, and I'll introduce our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Peter Smolich, who works for Cornell University through Extension and Applied Research. He is the State Extension Forester and serves as Director of the Cornell Maple Program and Director of the Cornell University r Not Teaching and Research Forest, which is a 4,000-acre forest down near uh, Van Etten. These activities take him throughout the state serving woodland owners and maple producers. He also coordinates Forest Connect, Cornell's Forest Resources Extension Program, by providing leadership for education to enhance the sustainability and stewardship of private forest lands in New York. Forest Connect, which is a website, uh, connects several activities such as a monthly web conference, development of demonstration sites, writing and editing bulletins, and providing training for Cornell Cooperative Extension educators, forest owners, and maple producers. He's also started a new uh, social media site, known, in, and I'll, I'll let you talk about that, Pete. But in addition to Forest Connect, he also has Forest uh, Connect name, what is that called? Forest Connect. I'm sorry. Forest Connect. Right, it's, so there's, there's two forest. Okay, good. Or there's two forest connect sites. A lot of information available. Uh, so, and today he's going to talk about best practices for timber production and value. And I guess I'll turn it over to you, Peter. Thank you, Rich. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. Good morning. I'm glad to be here. I'm even more glad that you all are here. So, I've got a, a handout that I'll pass around. This is a, an article that. Um, I actually wrote this article in, uh, to go in connection with this presentation. If you're a member of the New York Forest Owners Association, this is an article that uh, shows up, I think, in the current issue of the Forest Owner. I have a column that's called the Ask a Professional Column, and so it's, it's formatted in that context. Uh, at the top of the page uh, of that article, it has all of my contact information, my phone number, and my email address, and then there are two websites that I think uh, might be of interest to some of you. One, uh, you can't see them on this screen, one of them is just forestconnect.info. That's what I refer to as kind of my home page or my base page. Uh, it, it's where I, I keep uh, publications and links to workshops and things like that. Then there's another website that's longer, and I think the second one listed that's called cornellforestconnect.ning.com, and that's what Rich was describing as the social media or social network site. It's a, if you're familiar with Facebook, it's kind of like Facebook, but it doesn't have some of the drawbacks that Facebook has. Um, I'm not a big fan of Facebook. It has some, um, there are security issues that I just uh, would rather avoid. What, this, what the Ning site does is it allows woodlots for woodlot owners to, you, you, can, you can just go and visit and look at the content that's there. There's a forum so you can ask questions. There's a blog so we can share information. There's a calendar so we can, we can post events. You can post events, those of you that are in NIFOA chapters, if you have some act, um, activity going on and you want to publicize it, feel free to post there. In order to post information, so to ask a question or to respond to a question, you have to sign up as a member, which is free. Uh, but the, the nice thing about the Ning site is it has a security filter so that we can keep out the riffraff that shows up in, in other social media networks. So take a look at this. Um, there, are there more copies of that? Maybe that somebody can hand up to the front three or four copies at least. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Oh, okay. yeah. thanks. Oh, thanks. Okay, uh, one of the things that Rich mentioned, I, I offer a monthly webinar series. So, how many of you have seen webinars? 
Have you seen some of you have? Okay, so those are they're essentially a PowerPoint presentation like this. The difference is that I'm sitting in my office and you're sitting wherever you have a high-speed internet connection, and, uh, and then I give the presentation. You sit there and eat popcorn and do whatever else you do when you watch a, a, a PowerPoint presentation. This is one that I gave a few months ago, so if you if you've seen this, you'll you'll probably see a lot of similarities in, in what you saw in the webinar. All of those webinars, we've been doing those since the middle of 2007. All of those are recorded, so you can always go back and watch the recorded archives of those webinars. There's um, a great variety of topics. So today we're going to talk about uh, best practices for timber production, and this is, we talk about best management practices for water quality. Well, there are things that we can do if we're interested in uh, managing our woods, for timber production, but more generally to increase our profitability as it relates to woodlot management. So we'll focus on timber for a few reasons. Um, timber is nice because it allows you to recover some of the costs of management. As, as woodlot owners, we all have some costs associated with management. My wife and I own two parcels, and there are costs that are part of it, even if you're just paying taxes. Taxes, and they never go up, they never go down, do they? They always usually go up. So the nice thing about timber, there are established markets, so we don't need to worry about developing a market for the product we're trying to sell, and there are professional foresters who are capable and trained in helping us um, access those markets. Also through timber, we're able to, access, we're able to um, develop the additional objectives that we have on our property, whether it's for recreation or uh, wildlife habitat enhancement, or um, even some of the other products like agroforestry products or maple syrup production, we can develop those by being involved in timber production. So here are the 10 uh, best practices, and essentially I just went down the list, and, and you could make a much longer list, and as we're going along I may kind of add a few things in here and there, but I thought you know, what are the top 10 things of when I talk to a landowner, they come up to me and they say, I want to grow timber. I want to, I want to be profitable. I want to uh, produce, ultimately produce some kind of a timber crop. What would be the 10 top things that I would recommend to that landowner? So these are those top 10 things. They're not necessarily in order uh, of a priority from 1 through 10 or even in a sequence. Um, so don't, don't look at them at that, in that context. Maybe look at them in... Uh, in a holistic way and think about what you've done and what you haven't done and see where you might fit with these. So the first of the, is the importance of having a management plan. The, the, the benefits of a plan are first and foremost that not only do you clarify what your personal goals are, but if you do your plan right then you talk to the other people that co-manage your land, your wife or your children or your father or your uncle, and you make sure that you all have conversation about what's important to us for this property. Why do we continue to own it? Uh, what do we want to produce from it? And I say produce in a tangible and non-tangible sense. So it serves as a tool to help you communicate. It's important because of even the people that don't manage for timber, I think, need to have a management plan because it, you, it allows you, I say it allows you, it forces you when you have the plan, you go through a process you document the health of your forest. And it may be that your forest is healthy now, but in five years if something happens, maybe you don't remember what was going on in that northwest corner of your property. And so by having it documented now, you can look back on it and say there was a problem or there was not a problem five years ago. So you document the health, you document the resource, the timber resource that you have to work with. How big are the trees? How fast are they growing? How many do I have per acre? What's the current value of that timber? So you know what you have to work with. It's like any other plan. Your starting point is something that you have to work with. If you're interested in taking advantage of the federal tax structures that provide great opportunities for woodland owners, and we'll go into a little bit of detail on those, you have to have a management you don't have to, but it's, it would be to your, to your significant advantage under audit to have a management plan that says, I'm doing this to make a profit. The IRS, when, when you try and put yourself forward as a business, as a woodlot owner, to have a management plan that says, I want to make a profit, is a, is a much safer place than to say, 
this is a place I like to go ride my ATV and deer hunt, and I want a tax advantage for those for that privilege. So the, the management plan is helpful. You'll have a, a calendar of activities that allows you to schedule off, schedule and prioritize how you want to spend your time. And then for those of you that are interested in the New York State Forest Tax Law, which is the Forest Tax Law um, State or ECO Law 480-A, it's a requirement. You have to have a management plan. Um, anybody in 488? Okay. So 488, just some of you may be interested. Um, it's, it's the program in New York State that provides up to an 80% reduction in the assessed value of your forest land. Um, that's the, that's the, the, the nickel description of what it is. There are a lot of, of um, details that you need to pay attention to, and we can talk about those later if you'd like. So the planning process uh, involves talking with family members and clarifying what your objectives are, uh, talking with a forester, uh, Forrester is a trained professional that will help you understand what you have available on your property to work with. The Forrester will probably take some measurements depending upon how detailed of a plan you want. It, the measurements may be just visually inspecting your forest. If it's a 480A plan, it will be a much more detailed uh, set of measurements that they take. <coughs> you and your Forrester might help you do this is um, or another group of people that might help you do this are master forest owner volunteers. So these are their MFOs and there's a display in the back. The MFOs are people like you, they're forest owners, they're not foresters, but they're, uh, they're trained through Cornell Cooperative Extension to help you connect with resources that are helpful to you as a forester. And there are several MFOs in the audience. Um, so you can, you can sign up for a visit from a forest owner. One of the things they might help you do is to think about your time. Time is an acronym for time, interest, money, and energy. So what if you're going to have uh, an active role in managing the timber, you're going to have to put something into it to increase productivity. That involves time, interest, money, and energy, some combination of those. So you need to be deliberate in thinking about what you have for time. And then develop some kind of a work calendar. All right, so what should you do? Uh, talk with your family. If you haven't talked with your family members, uh, particularly the people that, uh, are, that make decisions on your property, then that's a, an important starting point. You can't develop a plan without having them involved. Uh, there may be other people that are important to involve in the conversation, but at a different level. And I think in kind of in concentric rings. And so for our property, my wife and I are the primary decision makers. <coughs> so we typically communicate pretty well about uh, what's going on in our property. We have our daughters who, you know, it's, they're young still, um, who at some point we want them to be more actively involved in the management. And so we, we share with them our logic, but they don't really play a, a big part in the decision making. And then we have in-laws that use the property, and so we make sure they're you know, at an outer level and, or people that we allow to hunt on our property. We make sure they know of our interest, but it's just more of a, here's what we're doing on the property so that they're staying informed. So you need to develop kind of a communication network. Think about your time, interest, money, and energy in a very realistic way. Uh, I tend to be an optimist, so I always think I have more time and interest and money and energy than I really do. Um, so uh, keep that in balance. And then find people that you can um, access for assistance, whether it's the State Forestry Agency is a good starting point, Master Forest Owner Volunteer, or if you hire a private consultant forester. Okay, a second best practice for timber production, and this is one that relates very directly to uh, timber production, is to encourage your trees to grow faster. Bigger trees, more wood, more timber, more value. Uh, trees, uh, if, only if trees are healthy and productive are they going to be growing well. Trees will grow uh, a little bit even when they, as they start to, to slow down or become stagnant. When they do slow down their growth, they're less resistant to the stresses that happen in the life of a tree. And, and stress is a common part of the life of a tree. Um, 
the faster you can get the trees growing, the more they're going to produce sooner, so it shortens your investment window. And you're, you're all, if you're interested in timber, you have some level of investment because you're, you're paying, you have those costs, but you haven't recovered any income to help offset those costs. So the sooner you can get those trees big enough to move them into a production cycle, the sooner you can start recovering those funds. Um, and the faster on a purely on a tree health perspective, the faster the trees are growing, the more resilient they are to those stresses. And the, the bottom picture shows, you can see some brown out in some of the crowns of these trees. These are trees that, uh, uh, it was either May of 2009 or 2010, we had the spring frost, remember that? So this was a hilltop at one of the, um, one, on the Arnott Forest and it browned out all of the sugar maple. Just so happened that coincided with that followed um, a drought year for us, and then prior to that we had a couple years of forest tent caterpillar and uh, gypsy moth defoliation. So on the crest of that ridge, we've had uh, about a dozen of our of our nicest sugar maple trees die back from the top. So it was that was just bad luck, um, even though those trees tended to be growing fairly. So this is illustrating what happens, or what you want to happen with fast growth. Uh, three different trees, the two on the left are coniferous. In the upper right hand corner, there is a, uh, this is a Norway spruce, and these two bars both cover 10 years of growth. Okay? So the short bar is covering 10 years of growth, the long bar is covering 10 years of growth. This is a Norway spruce from the pine plantaker. Spruce plantation, right? Spruce are in spruce plantations, pine are in pine plantations. Uh, the crowns closed, right? The trees were competing for sunlight, the growth slowed down, and so this tree ended up being part of the harvest, which is why I was able to access one end of the log. That's not a, an uncommon pattern. And the tree in the lower left hand corner is a tree from our property, it's a red pine, and it's showing. Um, a tree, these were a little over, not quite 50 years old, and uh, we had um, five rings in a tenth of a foot early on, and as the tree got older, the growth rate slowed down. So somewhere in the, you can't see it from where you are, somewhere in about 30 years of age, this was a natural stand of pine. The crowns closed and the growth rate slowed down. You can see that the site has good potential for growing pine. You know, some of those, some of those rings are quarter to a third of an inch in radial increment, so that's, that tree's putting on half an inch or more of diameter growth here. This is a great site for pine, but when they compete for sunlight, then it all shuts down. The final picture is one of my favorite for tree growth. This is a sugar maple stump. The stump is 15 inches in diameter, and when I took the picture, I zoomed in and I could see the growth rings, and so I put little tabs here in, in the outer 10 years of growth occurred over a two inch time frame. So, or two inches of space. In the last decade, that tree grew two inches on this side, one side of the tree, presumably four inches overall. So this is extremely fast growth for a sugar maple. And it happened because this was a good, good site, some good soil quality. The owner had been managing this area for firewood, so cutting out the low value trees for the last 30 years. So this, this particular tree was growing very well. You're probably asking then why was it was cut. It had fusarium canker, which is a contagious canker in sugar maple, and so they cut it as a, as a sanitation. Uh, here's another way to think about faster tree growth that translates into more money. So the last, the last slide was to illustrate what happens. It's primarily a function of competition for sunlight. The trees need room to grow, so they have, they have some light, adequate light. The reason why we want them to grow faster is partly for economic reasons. And what the, the table shows is, um, and this is from some numbers a few years ago, but look, the first column shows uh, the the grade of the log, so F and S is first and seconds, these are the lower quality stems that would come out of your woods, and the mill that produced these, and every mill would have a different set of mill specs, this mill, for their first and seconds, the trees needed to be 12 to 14 inches in diameter, 
and two to three faces clear. So a tree has four faces and two to three of those need to be clear of, of blemishes. If that's the case for maple, they were paying somewhere between $300 and $900 per thousand board feet. And a board foot, of course, is 12 inches by 12 inches by one inch thick. So at $300 to $900 a thousand, that's 30 to 90 cents a board foot. As the trees get bigger, same trees, they're, they're just getting bigger, they go up in value. Uh, so a select, by the time it's 15 inches and has at least three clear faces, now we're up to almost $1,200 per thousand. So as the trees get bigger, they have more volume, more, more units of value, more board feet in an individual tree, and each board foot is worth more. So it's, it's, a, it's doubly compounding. It's compounding in volume, and then the unit price is increasing. And that happens all the way up the grade ladder. When you get up to a veneer, you may be up in the $2,000 to $5,000 per thousand board feet. So it pays to have faster growing trees that get bigger. I did a little um, kind of mental calculation on this. Um, I worked with an extension educator a few years ago, and he had gone out and remeasured some trees where we had done some thinning. and. Uh, recorded their growth rate over the previous 10 years. And so we had a, an estimate of the growth rates of trees that had been either released from competition, so they had, they had um, greater access to sunlight or they were in a, in a competitive situation. So taking those numbers, we essentially um, for, tried to forecast the value that you would get by thinning versus not thinning. So we looked at an example acre, and, and most people don't have acres that look like this, so uh, I, I realize that, but just to make a comparison, if you have 60 crop trees per acre, which isn't, which isn't impossible, and 15 among each of four species, so black cherry, sugar maple, um, red oak, and white ash, and starting with an average uh, diameter of 13 inches in one log, and the log is 16 feet, uh, that, and, and based on the, the, the prices paid for those trees at that time, that acre had a value of about $1,600 an acre, a liquidation value, which is not, I mean, we don't, in management, we don't think about a liquidation value, but just as a comparison. So owner, number one, didn't do any cutting and just let the trees grow for the decade. And based on the, the growth measurements that, that were collected, over a decade, those trees would increase <coughs> from about 13 inches to just over 14 inches. So about an inch in diameter per decade. You remember that sugar maple I showed you was growing up to four inches in diameter per decade. Uh, with that kind of a growth, after um, a decade, the value increased from about $1,600 to just shy of $1,800. So a fairly small return on an uh, um, annual increment of value. The second owner did a crown thinning release, uh, so looked at those individual crop trees, cut the lower grade trees that were competing, and uh, had a growth increase that would almost double that up to about 15 and a half inches. And we assumed that because uh, of the added increment of diameter that there would be an increase in log length for some of those trees. That almost doubled the value, up to $3,300 per acre. So this is, I mean, this is an illustration. Don't can't go to your bank and get a loan on these kinds of calculations, but it, it, it illustrates the value that can happen from thinning. All right, so what should you do? First of all, you have to be patient. You know, in all these examples, I'm, the minimum increment I'm looking at is decade, right? So you're, you're not going to do something today and then show some kind of a timber response next year or the following year. So you have to be patient. You also have to go in and get the, get the junk out, particularly those lower value trees that are competing with your higher value trees. It's not unlike your garden, right? For those of you that garden, if you want your tomatoes to produce and you want your peppers to produce and you want whatever to produce, they need to have adequate sunlight, you pull the weeds, okay? You don't get paid for pulling the weeds, you know that you get a better harvest come October. You want to keep your good trees as a seed source. One of, the, one of the things we need to worry about as woodlot owners is where is our next forest going to come from? Right? The forest that we had today developed in the early part of the 1900s. We had very different conditions then. We didn't have 
as many deer, we didn't have problems with invasive species, uh, we didn't have problems with native species that were interfering. So we need to keep our, our good trees long enough for them to produce seed to establish the next forest because we want to make sure New York continues to have productive hardwood forests. The for U.S. Forest Service has done some research looking at timing for uh, when to harvest. And people always say, I've got such and such a tree in my woods, should I cut it? You can't look at individual trees and make decisions about what you're going to do in the woods. You need to look at the whole forest. On average, you optimize timber production to about 18 inches. When, when the average size tree is 18 inches. If the average size tree is 18, that means you have some that are much larger than 18 and still some that are smaller than 18. And before you start cutting, remember that last point, if the trees are your seed source, before you cut your seed source, you need to make sure that they've reproduced and then you can start thinking about um, harvesting those higher value trees. Uh, you need to bid the sale. So you'll, you've probably all been approached by loggers foresters or people that are, and this is not to say anything about, about loggers, foresters, and other people, but there are people that just go out and they try to buy timber. And they're, they're, what motivates them is not necessarily what motivates you. And if you have ownership objectives, remember the earlier point about talking through your ownership objectives, that may not align with just extracting the timber resource. So if you bid the sale, you'll, you'll get the best market value that you can obtain. And there are some publications, one's listed here, from Penn State on deciding when to cut. Okay, we've talked, to, mentioned a little bit about foresters and loggers, and uh, the point here is that foresters are not loggers, and loggers are not foresters. Uh, and, and the loggers and foresters that I know don't want to be the other one, so they are, they're very happy doing what they're doing. Let's look at both of them. Foresters typically have, some loggers do too, but foresters will have college training as a forester, uh, and they should have continuing education, right? Foresters that graduated in the 70s and the 80s, technology has changed. And although trees are still trees, the way that we manage trees and the way that we understand forest systems have changed in the last 10 years or 20 years. If your forester doesn't have continuing education and doesn't you know, regularly keep up to date, and they may not be able to serve you as well as you would like them to. When, when I think about what a forester really brings as value to a woodlot owner, um, I think it's their ability to describe what you're trading off when you make decisions. Or when you take no action. I mean, that's a decision, to take no action. In a forester, what they can really bring is to, to be able to sit with you and say, Yes, you can do that, here's what's going to happen. And if you do that, here's what you're not going to be able to do, or vice versa. And, and that's what you want with a forester. I mean, that's the counsel that you want from a forester. They have some skill sets as well to measure trees and put sales out to bid, but you really want them to be able to tell you what are you giving up or what are you not fully taking advantage of when you're making certain decisions. And they can do that in terms of, uh, of their training and tree biology and wildlife population dynamics and hydrology and things like that. There are three types of foresters. Uh, public sector foresters are people that are paid by your tax dollars. Um, primarily in New York, those are through the New York State DEC. You call the DEC, they'll, they'll send the forester, come out, walk your woods with you, and talk with you about what your options are. These are, um, they come prepaid. There's no additional cost, and this is, this is a great value that you should take advantage of. Consulting and industrial foresters are private sector foresters, so as a consulting forester, they either work for you or the industrial forester works for a sawmill or some kind of a wood utilizing industry. Uh, there, are, there are outstanding consulting foresters and outstanding industrial foresters. Like every profession, there are some people that don't fit that outstanding category. So you need to, it's, it's an effort to find a forester that you match with. The forester that works for your neighbor may not work for you, and vice versa. Loggers, uh, loggers are important. Loggers get a bad rap a lot of times because everybody you know, wants to pick on somebody. Uh, forestry doesn't happen without loggers, and a good logger is worth his weight in gold. We, have, we do a fair amount of timber harvesting on the Cornell properties. We found some outstanding loggers, and they're a pleasure to work with. 
we've also had some other loggers that are that that are more challenging to work with. Um, loggers should know how to safely operate their equipment and work in your woods, minimizing damage. Um, when you're in any of these harvesting operations, you're leaving behind something for the future. Whether it's young seedlings or trees that you want to get bigger, if you have a logger that doesn't pay attention to safe operations and, and effective equipment handling, then they're going to do more damage than the value that they're taking out and providing to you. And it's not so much, you know, people will say, oh, I, I want to use a, a horse logger because they're, going to do, they're not going to do as much damage. Uh, a, a logger, non-conscientious horse logger can do as a, a lot of damage. Um, and the loggers we have at the Arnott Forest that are good use big machines and they don't damage the residual trees. Now you can tell where the machines were because it's a big machine and you have to drive a big machine through the woods and you can see it. But they, they're minimizing damage to root systems and to stems and things like that. Okay, so what should you do? There's um, I have a number of publications on my website, theforestconnect.info, and one of them is a, is a bulletin. It's called the like the Forest Stewardship Bulletin, and there's a chapter on foresters and there's a chapter on loggers. If you're thinking about a sale, I'd start there. Uh, and then the rest of this relates to communication. Once you've communicated with the other people that own your property, you need to be able to share that vision with your forester and your logger. And if you find a good forester or a good logger, they'll be more than happy to work with you to help you achieve your vision. But you, it's, it's, the burden is on you to be able to describe that well. Okay, the fourth point, I'm gonna have to talk faster because I have 10 points and I'm halfway through, um, is, uh, is, is important. Hopefully you didn't inherit something like this because this makes it that much harder to grow timber but you want to avoid high grading. High grading is cutting the highest grade trees, the highest value trees, but not cutting the lowest value trees. Uh, farmers, you know, livestock farmers, it's the, it's the equivalent of reverse culling. And usually with, when, you're, when you're trying to improve the production of a herd, you're culling the lower, the non-productive animals. Um, think about going in and taking the most productive animals and sending them down the road and leaving the losers behind as your production system. You know, think about what's going to happen to your profitability, your efficiency, your health, all of that. So there are Dr. Nyland from the, uh, here in Syracuse at the College of Environmental Science and Forestry did a study a few years ago, the Timber Harvesting Assessment Project, and identified several characteristics that are, um, that are used to recognize when a hybrid happens. <coughs> Uh, the picture that you see is an area, as I recall, it's in Saratoga County. I was standing on a road. It was a beautiful wood. It was about a, a fairly large wood, about 100 to 150 acres. There is, um, a, I don't remember the details, it was an unusual family dynamic, and the primary owner had died, and there were siblings or children, and they were all making decisions independently of each other, and one of them was giving permission to cut, and the other one was saying, don't cut, and... Well, the, the left half of the road got cut. I, I saw the right half of the road that had been marked, and it was, it was like two different worlds. And so what was left behind were you know, trees. They, they had shifted the species composition from a diverse mixture of species to a fairly um, non-diverse mixture of species. They left behind deformed trees, defective trees, um, in an understory, that understory is interfering vegetation that will preclude the establishment of the next forest. So it's, it's uh, high grading can cause um, numerous problems. There's a lot of things, every high grade happens in kind of its own unique circumstances. Uh, it's some combination of greed and misinformation and um, who knows what. Uh, but the, the end result is that you're left with a forest that is not as productive as the previous forest. You can see this is a picture, I don't know if you can see there's a little bit of blue paint on this tree. So this tree is marked, all these other trees, notice this is the one big tree left standing is cut. Here's a beach, this is a red maple, uh, probably a beach here with a crooked top. So the one tree that has any value, and this one is questionable, 
got a, a branch here, something there. But look at these, there are stumps in the background. So this is a woodlot that has been repeatedly hydrated. And the logic that people use is, well, I'll just take a few of the good ones. And, and then the next time they come back, I'll just take a few of the good ones. Well, every time you do that, you're not replacing any of the good ones. It's like, I'm just going to drink the, the top half from the glass of milk. And I'll drink the next top half from the glass pretty much, pretty soon that the milk in that glass keeps going down. So, let me see if I can go backwards. Um, so what do you do when you hire a forester, tell your forester, I don't want to hydrate my woods, I don't want you to hydrate my woods. I want to, I want to practice sustainable forestry and I want you to guarantee me that you're going to practice sustainable forestry. And in most, you know, foresters will do that, and loggers, if you're clear about what your expectations are, um, I think that most of them would be happy to, to work with you on that. <laughs> the other way is to, is to spend time, get involved with groups like the New York Forest Hunters Association, and go out on woods walks and see other people that have harvest. A lot of the, the NIFOA chapters will have woods walks, and they'll go look at, at harvesting that has happened, and you can see examples of what good harvesting looks like. And then, you, and then you can see in contrast what, you know, just by driving around the countryside, you'll see examples that look like this and you'll know what to avoid. Um, roads and trails don't uh, maybe directly contribute to timber production, but they're an important part of ownership, which is then uh, related to timber production. Uh, the roads are important, or trails really are important because they get you into parts of your property that you might not otherwise go. And many of us are more than comfortable going, you know, walking off the trail and kind of bushwhacking through the woods. But I know, and I do a lot of that just from my job. In my woodlot, there's one section of our woods that doesn't have a trail into it. We've owned this property for uh, about six years. I've only been in there twice. Right? It's just. You know, I can walk in there easily enough, I just don't make it over there because there's no trail and it's not easy to get in there. It's easier just to stay on the trails. So those trails are important to get you into areas so that you can see the trees, so you can understand the resource that you have. Many of these properties are recycled, right? Somebody owned them before us or family members did. Some people put in trails and roads. If there's a good, good road system, reinvest in that road system to bring it up to an acceptable level. If it's not a good road system, don't put money into it. Install a different road or a new road. There are a lot of tools that you can um, access to help you with this. I would start with the Soil and Water Conservation Service in your county, which is another publicly tax-funded uh, um, agency. They can work with you on soils maps, on topographic maps, on satellite imagery, and they can help lay out a road system that matches what you want to accomplish as an owner. Um, when you're working with foresters and loggers, if you're going to have a harvest, make sure they know what you want to accomplish. And you may, you may able, be able to get them to do the work of establishing these roads and trails uh, without any effort on your part, per se, other than communication, and knowing that if you have them go on a circuitous path that takes more time, time is money, and so you may not make as much money on your timber, but you, you, you have the added benefit of a, of a more effective trail system. Um, what should you do? Talk, pay attention to your local MIFOA chapter, find out when there are woods walks, Go on those woods walks, look at the road systems um, when you're, you know, talk to other people, but also look and see what's happening on the ground. You can learn a lot observationally of what you want to do and also what you don't want to do. Get a hold of your soil and water conservation district or your extension office and find out what resources might be available to help you with planning. When you're out um, uh, in your woods, take flagging with you. And, and if you need to put in a new trail, use some flagging and, and ribbons and, and tie some on the trees and look at it. Think about wet spots. Look at it, you know, a couple different times a year because you don't want a trail to go through a soggy area. And then, and then you can plan your path and, and know where you want to go. There was a, a webinar that was offered through the University of Minnesota. And if you just did an internet search for something like Minnesota... 
uh, recreational trail webinar, you would come up with this link. Uh, it was, it was a, a webinar that was done in conjunction with the bulletin by the author on how to develop recreational trails in your woodlot. So if, if, you're, if you're going to be installing some of those, that would be a good place to look. Timber theft uh, has an impact on timber production because you're growing good timber, but somebody else is cashing in on it. So we want to avoid that. Um, this was a study that was done a few years ago by Hugh Canham and Ron Peterson looking at uh, uh, getting, asking people to report on what their experiences were with timber theft. What they found was that it happened primarily on private land. Not surprising, the thieves would, would not tend not to uh, steal from uh, public land, partly because there's a lot more private land, but also public land is carries some bigger consequences. They're more, maybe more likely to get caught. Only 40% of the theft was noticed immediately, suggesting that 60% was not noticed immediately. A part of that is because there's a lot of absentee owners, and you can have, unless you're out on a regular basis as an absentee owner looking at your property, it may be months before you find, or years before you find, that you've been a victim of theft. The average volume removed was about 17,000 feet, going as high as 50,000, and the average value about $10,000, as high as $70,000. So that's not that's not insignificant. And it's you know there are a lot of ways that timber theft can can happen, and it may be as simple as uh, in working. So some there's there's accidental timber theft, and then there's deliberate timber theft, and and accidental theft happens. Somebody doesn't truly doesn't know where the boundary line is. Now they should know where the boundary line is, but if they don't, some of your trees may be cut, um, and that's accidental. The, the deliberate theft, though, you, you can imagine they just have to come across the line. They grab the property line. They grab three or four or five of your best trees. They don't cut just you know they don't cut the low value of trees for you. Right? They don't do any of the thinning that you want done. They cut the best value of trees. They take them out. They do that a couple times a week. That's a heck of a business plan, isn't it? It helps pay their, pay their fuel bills, pay their equipment costs. Um, so we talked about this. They'll, they tend to cut the best trees. They typically don't worry about damage to your residual trees because, after all, they're thieves. They're not really conscientious people. They're not opposed to cutting boundary trees that have posted signs and uh, markers that, look, that, that identify that property. Uh, and, and they just, they're just not worried about the damage that they do. There is protection from the law. A few years ago, New York State upped the ante on timber theft laws. It used to be there was almost no real penalty for timber theft laws. That's now uh, increased significantly. Uh, so there, there's more power in the courts. The downside is, as you see here, um, you know, so a third of the victims knew the thief's identity uh, only 10% reached a desirable resolution. So 90% did not reach a desirable resolution. Uh, and part of that is because the people that have timber theft as a business plan don't actually own any of their own equipment. So there's nothing for the courts to put a lien against. They don't know their, their girlfriend owns the skitter, the girlfriend owns the house, the girlfriend owns the truck. And this is just a guy, and I, I remember hearing stories um, from Mike Grayson, who did a lot of timber theft um, investigations, you know, there were these thieves that would just constantly go out and steal timber, and he talked about one client that was 10th in line to get a judgment. So uh, this it's, it's scary when it happens. So the important thing is it's easier to prevent a problem than solve a problem. So have a legal survey, know where your boundaries lines are, mark your boundary lines, Communicate with your neighbors. Uh, make sure that your neighbors know that when you're having a timber sale, you're going to talk to them so that they can be alert to that and, and ask them to keep you informed when they're going to cut timber. So it gives you a chance. What I would want to do is if my neighbor was having a timber sale, I'd want to go out and talk to the logger. And I like, just in general, I like loggers. They're nice people. But then I want to go and walk the boundary line with them and say, see this? This is my boundary line. If you have any questions, call me. And I'll be out next week to just make sure everything's going okay. 
Okay, management plans help. Having a timber sale contract helps because in your, when you have, so the other way you can steal, lose timber to theft is you have a sale and you think you're going to sell these trees and a few extra trees disappear. So the timber sale contract stipulates how that process should work. If you um, are in the unfortunate situation of, of encountering a thief in action, um, just so you know, the first reaction you have is probably not a legal reaction. <coughs> so the best way to respond is to stay calm, call your environmental conservation officer, the DEC um, officer, the state police, the sheriff. Uh, you may have to make a couple of different phone calls depending upon the county to find somebody that recognizes these are more than just trees. Um, collect all the information you can if the, if the, if the theft is happening from a neighbor, Make sure you have the neighbor's contact information, license plates, name of the logger, things like that. It's possible that the, the logger, you know, the loggers that have this as part of their plan are pretty smooth. And they'll say, I'm very sorry, I am so sorry, you know, I cut three of these trees, I didn't mean to do that. How about if I write you a check for $2,000? And you think, wow, three trees, $2,000? Sure, and then on the memo it says, four trees cut. It doesn't say four three trees cut, it says four three trees cut, four, four trees cut. You take the check, you cash it, you now have a contract. Right? You come back later, and you don't see three stumps, you see 30 stumps, and you call the police, and the logger says, oh, look at the check, it says for trees cut. I thought I was getting a pretty good deal, only paid $2,000 for 30 trees, but that's what the owner agreed to. We cashed the check. So don't accept money. Wait for the law enforcement. Take pictures. Okay, point number seven, um, avoid damage during your harvest. There, there are two categories of harvest. One harvest is when you're trying to thin your woods and improve the residual trees that are already there. So you're cutting the lower grade trees and you're leaving the best trees behind to grow, to get bigger, to grow, to produce seed before the final harvest. The other type of harvest is when you're trying to regenerate the so in the first type of harvest, you're leaving your best trees behind. This is your, you're leaving your investment in the woods. And the, the damage that you can do during harvest of your low value trees, the damage to your higher value residual trees can, that can, can overwhelm any value that you might have obtained in that, in that low value harvest. So it's more important to have a good logging contractor, good layout of skid trails so that you can avoid that damage. Um, there are, I'm always impressed in the loggers that have kind of tricks of the trade to keep things running smoothly in the woods. This is a picture of a, of a harvest that was done up in um, Franklin County. It was huge equipment, full-size um, feller bunchers and grapple skidders. And this, and this is just an example. We're looking down a skid trail, and this was a beech tree that was marked for cutting. And what the, the feller buncher operator did was he cut it high on the stump. He high stumped it so, so that this would remain in place and protect the maple tree from getting banged up when, this, when the skitter went by. So just little things like that, that that differentiate good logging contractors from not good logging contractors. I think that root damage is, is as bad or worse than stem damage. Partly because you don't see it 10 years later, you don't see the actual damage, you also don't see the effects of the damage. When you, when you have ruts through the woods like this, all of these trees, the root system is in the tops, primarily in the top six to eight inches of the soil. So if you're rutting down, you know, in this case it was 18 or 20 inches, you've sheared off those roots that are, for the trees that are next to the skid trail, you've provided a point of entry for micro or decay organisms to get into the tree, and you've started to compromise the root system. Trees can handle a partially stressed root system until you add a secondary stress on top of that. So you have root system damage, and then 10 years later you have an ice storm event, or a drought, or uh, insect defoliation. Then you have two stresses. You may have stressed the top of the tree and the bottom of the tree, um, uh, those trees then are less likely to survive. When you put in your forester puts in skid trails, they should recognize there are going to be some bumper trees. These are trees that are, it's a 
kind of a cost of doing business, you minimize the number of those, but by placing them strategically on corners, um, you'll protect the trees that are to the interior. You may have trees that are marked as, um, as cut trees that could serve as bumper trees. You're, and this was from a Cornell job, actually. It was uh, a bit irritating. Um, the, the stump that you see in the foreground is marked for harvesting, but the trees along the skid trail should be cut late in the harvest cycle, not early in the harvest cycle. This was a, a lazy logger that wanted to get logs out quick. These are close to the trail. He cut it. When he cut it, along the skid trail, this was on a corner, this was a residual black cherry tree that we were going to grow for a veneer quality tree. It's no longer a veneer quality tree. It'll never be a veneer quality tree. So pick your logging operators carefully. Time of year is important. Uh, this was an area uh, also in Saratoga County. This was a firewood harvest, so it was intended to get the low value wood out and leave behind the better value trees. Uh, it happened in April and May, and what and the, the logger was using this as a skid trail and would care would try and squeeze big wads of trees um, down the skid trail and ended up doing damage, you know, 12 feet of damage. You expect a little bit of damage along the skid trail, but that's excessive damage. Okay, legal options to control costs. We're going to go through this fairly quickly because it's there's a lot of detail and there's a lot of information that's available. So I'm more interested here in making you aware that the, some of these resources are available. So 480A is New York State Forest Tax Law. It requires 50 contiguous acres. It requires a commitment to produce a forest crop. So if you have 50 acres and you own it because you like to deer hunt, this isn't going to work for you. Um, you have to have a management plan that's written by a private sector forester, the DEC forester plan will not qualify for this, and you have a 10-year rolling forward commitment. So every year you go, and I don't remember where you go, where do you go, to the town assessor, tax collector, and every year you make a commitment for the next 10 years. Um, at, at whatever point you decide you no longer want to be part of the program, you still have to fulfill the obligations of your management plan for the next 10 years. You lose the tax break, but you still have the obligations of that 10 year. Um, you work within a 15 year work schedule, and that's a, that's a mandatory work schedule. So if it says in 2012 you're going to thin uh, 15 acres of hardwood to increase the growth of the residual trees and you fall and break your leg, you still have to thin that 15 acres. Uh, there's a little bit of flexibility in there, but not a huge amount. And then you still have, it's really the, the 40 is, is a deferment of taxes because when you do finally have your harvest, you still pay a 6% yield tax to the, to the to, I don't recall, the count, town or the county. There are some benefits, um, and I say this hesitant, 40A is not for everyone. Right? Be aware of it, think about it, but don't run out and, uh, and sign on the dotted line. You can have up to an 80% reduction in the assessed value of the eligible tract of woodlands. That doesn't include your house. Okay? It's 80% reduction in the assessed value of your forest land. Um, participation in 480A can position you to be very clearly in the active in the trader business. This isn't required to be active in the trader business, so don't do don't get into 488 just for this reason. Um, the management costs, if you're active in the trader business, as we'll see in a minute, all of those management costs can be expensed, uh, deducted in the year that you incur them, and it does encourage good management. I've talked about some of the uh, some of the pitfalls. Uh, recognize if you try to get out early and force an exit from the program, it's fairly expensive. It's something like two and a half times the normal tax rate for the previous ten years. So that's not that's not terrific. What, what about the labor that you use to pay people to do the thing? So if you truly pay somebody, yeah. you can and you record that. Yeah. Um, you can deduct that as a management expense. 
Um, you would need to look into what it means to have an employee. I don't, right? I mean, there's. I'm, I'm not a tax attorney. Right. Um, I'm a forester, so don't you know? I, I'm, I'm skimming. You're, you're getting the full depth of my knowledge on this here, so don't, don't, uh, don't. Which isn't very much. Um, so make sure you talk to an accountant about what it would mean to pay somebody. I think you can, you know, pay children, um, family members. You cannot pay yourself. I, I'm not aware that that's ever worked. On the Fed, so that's 488 is New York State law. At the federal level, uh, the U.S. government recognizes that growing trees is part of a business, and there are specific provisions for woodlot owners to to ensure that we um, contribute to the, the productivity of forest land. Uh, the one thing to take away from this is timbertax.org. Okay, if there's only one thing you write down, timbertax.org is a website that's managed by the uh, U.S. Forest Service tax specialists and then one of the, I think it's the University of Georgia tax specialists. Just as a kind of an overview here, uh, why you would want to be an active owner. And being an active owner is fairly easy to accomplish. It, it means there are five, you have, to, you have to say yes to one of five options. So one option is you do more work than anybody else on the property. Or, or you're the only one that does any work on the property, which is what my wife and I fall under. Or you do more work than anybody else on the property. Um, and I don't remember the other three, but most, I, it's rare that I meet a landowner that wouldn't qualify to be active in the trade or business. You don't get, there's no, you don't get a stamp, you don't get a badge, you don't get anything like that. It's just, you can document because of the way you spend your time that you are primarily involved. If you're active, so there's three, three things that you can be. You can be an investor, you can be passive, or you can be active. The beauty of being active is that all of your management expenses are deductible. Taxes, your, if you're paying a mortgage, the interest on the, on the mortgage income, um, if you buy chainsaw, bar oil, is all of that is deductible against any income source. So I've never made any money from my property, but every year I'm able to deduct it against my Cornell salary, and that's fully legal. Um, same with taxes, interest expenses. You also have the option to, under what's called a, one, a Section 179 deduction, write off a capital expense of up to $100,000 against any income source in the year that you incur that expense. So this is, this is you know, certainly useful for agricultural if a farmer wants to buy a tractor. Uh, we bought an ATV to use for management of our timberlands. Um, and I keep, you know, my, my CPA told me, are you really using this? And I said, yeah, and I have a log. Every time I use my ATV, I report how many hours I used it, what section of the woods I drove into, why I was in the woods with an ATV. So it's, the ATV is not a toy, it's a work tool. But you can, so there are other kinds of expenses, and it's nice to be able to, to have that kind of a write-off. You also can take advantage of capital gains, tax structures, um, and this is, this is an older example, um, but the, so the, the numbers will have changed, the, ta the capital gains rate changes every year. Some of you are, will know more about this than I do, but it um, essentially means when you have a timber sale, you don't pay, or you don't have to worry about paying ordinary income, you have a lower tax rate on your income, which is, can be very significant. Um, so there are a couple of other uh, determining basis and keeping records. Uh, I'm essentially out of time, so I, I want to get on to the, to the last item or so. There is a webinar recently that was offered by the tax specialists. If you go to uh, forestry webinar, I think it's singular, not webinars, forestrywebinar.net, forestrywebinar.net, those are, are webinars offered by um, uh, Linda Wang and John Green, who are tax specialists with the U.S. Forest Service. And they talked about determining basis, and I think they had one on keeping, on record keeping.
You need to have a timber sale contract when you're selling timber to help protect what restrictions are there. Uh, we have an example on the Forest Connect website of a sample timber sale contract. Uh, I think it's done in a way that you can't just print it and use it, which would be crazy because every contract needs to be specific to that individual sale. So it's, it's put up for, for educational purposes, not for you to just save 200 bucks on attorney fees. So use it as a starting point. Um, your forester probably has a sample plan that can be modified as well. The DEC has a sample plan that you can modify. And then the final point is to continue your education. This is, you know, we've covered a fair amount of detail, I think, in an hour. There's obviously a lot more that you can cover. So take advantage of the resources that are out there. Uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension has a, has a primary function in providing educational resources and uh, we'll be as responsive as we can to the, to the needs of woodland donors. New York Forest Donors also has a strong interest uh, in providing educational assistance. If you're not a member of the New York Forest Donors Association, I'd encourage you to join. Uh, I'd also encourage you to, if you have never had a visit, if you're, particularly if you're new to activity, maybe you've owned your woods for 20 years, but new to the activity of woodlot management, uh, request a visit from a master forest owner volunteer.